Um, yeah, Chandra and I are happy to be joining forces again for such a beautiful and powerful slogan that we will be delving into tonight. Um, I know I've said this every single week, but when I saw the slogan, I was like, oh, thank God, we really need this one. Um, so I, I hope it'll find, you'll find the same sense of support in that. Do you all want to make an, your announcements first? Okay, so before we'll please hand it over. I'll do oh, the wonderful. We know that Michael Owen is gonna be Friday teaching on Friday night. He's gonna be talking about the Dharma bums, the folks of the beat generation and um, how they encountered Dharma and were part of how we're probably practicing Dharma because they brought some of that here, probably specifically to San Francisco and more broadly to the West. So that should be an interesting um, talk, historical in nature, I suspect, I don't know. Uh, and then um, on, it's Saturday, Sunday, right? Sunday. Oh, Sunday. On Sunday, Teg O'Malley, assisted by Mace, is gonna be doing that queer CEB. We've mentioned it a couple of times. Um, but that is coming up this weekend on Sunday. What time is it? Early. Uh, maybe it starts at 10 or something or nine, like that. Nine, but I think. the information is actually on the homepage of and, the SFDC site. And that's a six week series. So you, you want to sign up for it ahead of time. And Katie just put the link in the chat for folks if you want to register for that. So that'll be great. And then... Um, it's just awesome if you guys can contribute some dollar bills or hundred dollar bills to the SFDC, the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, all of your generous contributions help us continue to come together and experience the teachings. In this case, from Chandra and Eve and from the Lojong, from Atisha. And uh, it's really just wonderful to see how the community comes together. And I certainly appreciate everyone's contribution. And also we are able to provide the Dharma Collective does also give back contributions that you give to our teachers. Um, so that's also really nice. Uh, so there's links in the chat if you wanna just go ahead and jump on that right now or you can find the donations tab on the website and you can offer donation that way too. So just to put that out there for everyone and thank you so much for your time and energy and all the ways that you might support the collective otherwise and certainly for coming to Wednesday night and maybe going to some of the other activities that the collective offers. Thanks everyone. And Noam just reminded us in the chat that there's also uh, the SFDC Queer Sangha Saturday. So there's information about that in the chat. Cool. So it's sort of like uh, intermittent pride weekend in SFDC. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and get us started. And Chandra and I will um, be going back and forth in conversation, really weaving together different ideas and approaches to these, uh, to this timeless and very necessary wisdom. Uh, before I get started, I'm, I'm going to just put a tiny bit more onto that announcement um, for the, the QCEB, the Cultivating Emotional Balance. Some of you have taken that course with me. Um, some of you have um, heard of it and never gotten to take it. And we, you know, I just really want to um, explain that I think it's invaluable for these times to delve deeply into the psychological understanding of our emotions with the Dharma as our guide. Um, and to come together in a supportive queer community is such a precious offering. This is the first time that has ever been offered. Um, so really encouraging you, if you yourself identify as queer and want to join and or please share with your friends. This is just like a really awesome offering. Imagine starting your Sunday at 9 a.m. and by 11.30, you've got all these tools and skills to handle whatever comes. So just an extra plug. Um, but uh, I want to, um, again, welcome everyone. I put in the chat, uh, what are our kind of, um, what I aspire for us all to adhere to in terms of the qualities we wanna to bring to our practice. 
Chandra and I have been so delighted that we really have started to generate and cultivate here a collective, a community. And many of you are coming every week and we so just, we are so grateful to, to that. And so we also have started to develop this kind of shared understanding. And yet we also so welcome and appreciate those of you who are coming occasionally, or maybe it's your first night, like my dad downstairs. Um, so for, for those folks for whom it's new, it's really important and worthwhile for us to just think about how we're coming together in community. You're not here reading a book or listening to an audio, you are here with others. And that's because all these teachings require not only our personal practice, not only these incredible teachings passed down through many generations, they require all of us together. It's through our relationships that this work comes alive. And through our relationships in which we see, as Pema Chodron would say, where we're still stuck. So I invite you in our process of connecting with one another, either through the chat or communication, to notice where your judgment arises, where you feel constricted and meet it with as much compassion as possible. But our request and our expectation is that we create here a community that feels safe, caring and free. If we can't have some basic sense of belonging and connection here, it will be hard for us to do the work we need to do, applying these teachings to our life. So our hope is that we come here together with these qualities of discipline, generosity, patience, and of course, joyful enthusiasm. And we treat each other just as the completely precious and divine beings that we are. So really holding each other with the most um, care that we can. And as always, if there's a way that something occurs in this night that it really is, um, even if you find it slightly disruptive to your practice, if there's a way that we uh, as teachers or as a community are, are missing out on a community of inclusivity, please let us know. I know that can be really hard. So feel free to reach out to um, Mace or Pamela and let them know to tell us. Um, we really want your um, feedback. We want this place to feel supportive to all of you. So we're gonna start this evening with a practice of settling the mind in its natural state. You've probably noticed that Chandra and I have been leading this practice throughout Lojong. And that's because it is an invaluable practice for us to ventilate the heart and mind. As a, one of our shared teachers, Jennifer Wellwood always says, everything goes better with space. And so in this practice, we cultivate and you know, hopefully get glimpses of what it's like to create and feel the spaciousness of, not actually create, but what it's like to create the opportunity to experience the spaciousness of our own mind. So that will be our first practice. We are going to do two practices tonight as we have often done. So one in which we're creating the space and one in which we're creating the alchemy, the transformation of Tonglen. Since we've been now <clears throat> moving our way through uh, already 10 slogans in the course of setting up for our practice tonight, I am gonna remind us of our preliminaries. It's so useful to remember the preciousness of this human life, no matter what, no matter when. And I think especially when times continue to be so difficult um, for many of us as they are, given financial circumstances, health, political issues and um, climate change being more and more revealed, it can be very useful for us to ground in these simple preliminaries. So we'll do some preliminaries and then we will settle our mind in its natural state. So I invite you to return to some of the wonderful instructions that Chandra is offering us with our posture. So just to refresh us with our posture, we're really focusing on a series of different points, noticing where our palms are resting on our knees or folded in our lap. Really noticing and tuning into where we are sitting, meaning where the spine is rising up from the pelvis. Are we leaned forward? Are we leaned back or to the side? And inviting a sense, an aspiration of vividness and uprightness through the spine.
finding ease, relaxation, and a full sense of presence through the belly, letting the breath flow naturally. Inviting ourselves to check into where our head is resting on the neck. Noticing whether the chin is maybe sloping forward or sloping backward. And whether our eyes are opened or closed, feel a softness in the gaze, a releasing or unplugging of the eyes. Allow yourself to arrive fully in this moment. As though each breath, you were more fully inhabiting the body. And as we begin this practice, returning to our preliminaries, taking a moment to reflect on this simple and beautiful phrase. Let us together maintain an awareness of the preciousness of human life. Let us together reflect and meditate upon an awareness of the reality that life ends. Death and impermanence comes for everyone. And together, let's reflect on recalling that whatever we do, whether virtuous or not, has a result. And though these phrases might feel a little somber, their intention is to motivate us to recall the preciousness of this life, the shared experience that we all will be heading towards death sooner or later. And that every instance of our thoughts and behaviors has a result. Gently release these preliminary practices, hopefully igniting our motivation. And we'll begin now to just settle the body in its natural state. inviting the qualities of our posture, relaxation and ease. 
as well as dignity, awakeness. Invite along as well this quality of stillness. Still like the mountain, stable, dignified. Many of us may have already noticed that as we're settling the body in these qualities of dignity, relaxation, stillness, that the inner speech is still moving and busy. In order for us to settle the speech, let's focus on the natural rhythm of the breath. Noticing the breath as it travels in, noticing the breath as it travels out. Feel or imagine the innocent joy of this natural rhythm of the breath. As though it were the natural rhythm of the breath of a sleeping baby without a single care in the world. And then settling the mind, inviting the mind to be right here in this present moment. Not leaning towards the future, not dragging from the past. Without grasping onto any thought, memory or image. Without distraction. And with the utmost simplicity, continue to follow, follow the natural rhythm of the breath.
Gently shifting our anchor, our focus. Steady the mind now to simply notice sound. Again, without grasping or without distraction, without even needing to label as good or bad, or the sound of a car, the sound of feet walking by. Simply noticing sound, letting sounds near and sounds far. Be the object of our focus, help us steady the mind. without tightening, continue to refine the granular focus on sound. Noticing where sounds are arising from. Noticing when the sounds dissipate. Noticing other sounds that may be steady. For the moment, continue excluding all else, thoughts or sensations. Maybe even if there's a smell or a taste, just focusing on sound. And possibly, if you're fortunate, a space between sound. Now we gently shift from this narrowed focus, this attention and shamatha, from sound into the space of mind and the thoughts that arise within it. Instead of noticing sounds that arise and fall, we notice the thoughts that arrive and dissipate, again, without engaging or energizing without becoming distracted or caught up, as though we were leaning back in our own mind, noticing the space of the mind 
and the thoughts are rising and falling within. The difference between simply caught up in thought and observing the space of the mind is simply space, vividness and vastness. The thought still arises. We simply don't engage, don't energize, don't follow. Settle back into the spaciousness around that thought, that memory, that image. If you find that you have been caught up in distraction, in grasping, simply relax, release, and refresh your interests in noticing the space of the mind and whatever arises within it. A couple more precious moments here. If the mind feels hopelessly busy and you're just getting exhausted from one thought to the next, continue to relax, release and refresh. If you feel just spaced out, nothing happening whatsoever, focus more on that refreshing of your interest, noticing the quality of space between thoughts.
gently regathering the attention and your awareness into the field of the body. Taking a couple breaths, noticing the sensations through the rise and fall of the belly. Thank you all for your practice. <clears throat> Thanks to my cat for Zoom bombing once again. I knew he'd come at just the right time. So Chandra, um, we had decided that we would take a little time for questions here before we go in. Yeah, anyone have questions or thoughts on that practice? So interesting, I've led that practice many, many times and received it, always eyes open, and yet eyes open did not occur to me tonight. So we did a settling the mind with eyes closed, which I definitely have often done in retreat centers where there's too much activity. Um, but it was a different uh, quality of practice for me. So if that might have been something you you all noticed. Any reflections, questions, or comments in the chat? Or you can raise your hand. Such a simple practice and very, <laughs> very challenging to not engage with our thoughts as they are coming. I find that sound is a good parallel. It's easier in some ways for most of us to not get hooked in the same way we get hooked by thoughts when we hear a motorcycle coming and going. Question here. Is it ever meditating when you engage with thoughts, if you focus on each one? Chandra, what do you, what do you think about that? Usually when we're taking, when we're doing shamatha with the mind, we are noticing thoughts that arise and pass with the, in the mind, like what Eve just guided us through so beautifully, uh, but we're not like f purposefully then fixating on one thought, then the next, then the next. What we're doing is we're more like Eve instructed us, leaning back and connecting more with the, the space of the mind, that domain or the arena in which the thoughts arise and pass away. So there may be some, you know, the Buddha said that there are as many meditative techniques as there are people on the planet. So who knows, out there there might be a technique. I'm not so aware of it. Thoughts are so fickle. They're like the wind. You know, they say the thoughts are like the wind. They're, they're always moving this way and that. And so focusing on thoughts one after the other um, can be a difficult way to cultivate stability if that's what you're trying to do. And it reminds me of a teaching that Sogyal Rinpoche gave once, and he tells this story, he told this story of a time that he was at 
one of those outdoor Tibetan operas. I don't know if anybody has ever, you know, been to a Tibetan opera. They take place outside. They last days on end where you're sitting and in the courtyard of the monastery, there'll be these llama dances and singing and other, you know, the trickster running around making people laugh and Tibetan style of the circus, you could say, but a spiritual one because it always has some kind of um, Buddhist teaching in it. Or King Gesar of Ling is another topic of the Tibetan operas. But in any case, he was saying he was at these one of these long operas, and he was sitting next to his teacher Dilgo Kense Rinpoche, one of the great Dzogchen masters of all time, who died, I think, in the eighties. Dilgo Kense Rinpoche, or Dingo Kense Rinpoche, depending on how you pronounce his name, what dialect you're speaking in. And he was kind of sitting at the feet of Dilgo Kense. You know, they're sitting in rows, and I think Dilgo Kense was on a throne or a chair behind him. And so, so Gil Rinpoche, as a young man, said that he, he, tur- he kept asking him, Rinpoche, what is meditation? Tell me, what is meditation? And Dilgo Kense kept kind of batting him off, like, I'm trying to watch the show, you know, stop bothering me. So he'd ask again, what is meditation? Please tell me, what is meditation? <laughs> I think these, these operas can be very long. <laughs> I can imagine needing to fill the space a little bit. And uh, finally, Dilgo Kense said to him, you know the space between one thought and the next? And so Gil Rinpoche said, yes. And he said, prolong it. <laughs> prolong it. And so it's not necessarily the thoughts we're engaging with, it's that space of the mind that within which the thoughts arise and pass. It's the space between thoughts, you could say. Beautiful. Other questions or reflections? If not, we will push ahead with our slogans. Okay. I am going to enter it in here. I, I, I hope you will find the same just um, poignancy and joy that this is our slogan for the evening. When the world is filled with evil, sound familiar? Transform all mishaps into the path of Bodhi. And uh, Chandra is going to be giving us some wonderful um, reflections and commentary, really coming out of the traditional understanding of of these phrases and words. And I was really struck reading Chandra's notes and looking at this slogan at what the Western psychological approach is to evil. Um, And in fact, how that in some ways can can help us in a little bit of an understanding of this idea here. So this idea of how always through each slogan, how are we transforming? How are we transforming our mind and our heart together? And what that means is we we can't just transform the heart without mind. They're they're not separate. There has to be a wisdom, a knowing, an ability to really see, well, what is this evil that I'm pointing to out there? So as anyone here who has done psychology 101 through, if you are uh, a glutton for punishment, 201 and beyond, maybe you remember or recall that some of the very foundational studies of psychology that happened after World War II really looked at the phenomena of how could evil occur at such a great level. And when we look at World War II, the great philosopher and writer, Hannah Arendt, um, as any great philosopher and writer, there's controversy. And yet she wrote this book um, about the Adolf Eichmann trial. Again, many of you are familiar with this, but to brush up your 101 or 201 psychology. This was a trial in which a pretty high up uh, SS officer was being questioned. Um, He was being questioned in Israel around um, what was the experience he was having and how could he have carried out these atrocities um, so many times. And the famous phrase that is somewhat misunderstood that came out of this trial that Hannah Arendt wrote was, that this man who seems by every account to be pure evil, to be a psychopath, she said in fact that he represents the banality of evil, that evil isn't this you know, conniving, 
terrible person out there to destroy with true bloodlust. This is someone who wants to belong, who's trying to be part of something that he wants to be, you know, a moving, um, you know, a, a way that this can move forward. So he, there, it's sometimes misunderstood over simply as I was just following orders. Though he said that many times in the trial, of course he knew that there were consequences, deadly consequences. There's also a way in which it wasn't as though, again, he himself was pure evil. He was carrying out policies, procedures, and ideas. And he himself, he, he was trying to fit in with what was happening around him. It in no, may, in no way, shape or form makes what he did okay, but it starts to shift and change how we understand evil. So some of you may be aware that um, there were a series of psychological experiments, most famously, famously um, of Stanley Milligram and most famously and well repeated, meaning this is an experiment that was done not just once, but many times in many parts of the world. And in this experiment, what we see again is what are the conditions that can create someone to act terribly, for someone to be evil. Um, and in this case, the study was set up that, let's say I uh, invited Katie into the room. I said, Katie, you're gonna be a research participant. Um, you know, you're gonna get $4, because when the study was done in 1961, that was the amount of money. I'm gonna give you $4. There's a person over there and they are in a learning experiment. I need you to give an electric shock to them every time they do it wrong. And so who they're looking at on the other corner, they're actually, they're looking at, um, God, I don't want to choose anyone to do this. Uh, they're looking at me. <laughs> and I'm trying to put these words together and I keep getting it wrong. And so Chandra says, Chandra's the experimenter, Katie, give her a shock. Little does Katie know I'm in on the experiment. I'm not getting shocked. But the whole setup was how much will someone follow orders to make another person experience pain and it escalates and escalates so chandra keeps telling katie oh she gets it wrong give her another one meanwhile i'm like oh oh this is hard i have a heart problem and they expected that you know of maybe a hundred participants three of them would keep going on after these more escalating and difficult amounts of electric shock being given and what they found to their surprise was that again, repeated many, many times, more than 60% of people gave the shock so far that me as the actor in the other room slumped down as though I was almost dead. And so this, this experiment again shows that there's a way in which evil can be co-created. It's not an, this evil being as we get to have in our movies, right? Where they're just, God, they're terrible. It's that evil is co-created by causes and conditions and circumstances. And this is such a interesting, I mean, none of these studies point to uh, Buddhist philosophy, but when you look at them through that lens, you, we think of well, what does it mean to then transform these acts of evil into Bodhi? It's to help us understand not that we could be like them, but that many people can succumb to these pressures, these circumstances, that create evil moving through them. And that can hopefully awaken our heart to exchange their suffering, to transform their suffering with our practice. Wow, that's so interesting. It makes me think of so many different directions this could go. I mean, the interdependent or the co-arising dependence, right? The tendril in Tibetan of evil, what is evil, is really deep and complex and definitely in line with uh, what the Buddha taught. In order for evil, there has to be good. For black, there needs to be white. Long, there needs to be short. These are, you know, dualities that co-arise together. You don't just have one like in the movies, which would be nice. I think we, like children, you know, expect it to be simple or want it to be simple. I mean, I'm not degrading children. Of course, children are very intelligent. Maybe they're more intelligent than we are. 
Maybe we've trained them out of that. But in any case, when the world is filled with evil, transform all mishaps into the path of Bodhi. And one way to do that is through the type of understanding that Eve is talking about, like understanding circumstances, this banality of evil. Like why? Why was Hitler the way he was? Why is Trump the way he is? Why is my enemy the way they are? Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh often says, through when you understand someone and how they came to be the way they are, then you can give rise to authentic compassion because you have a deeper understanding about how it is that they came to where they are in the moment, even if it is horrible. There is a more texture to it, more intelligence to it, and a deeper capacity to have compassion, which then can transform, right? So it's like through the through the faculty of compassion that we, or bodhicitta, as you know, the spirit of awakening or this compassionate heart-mind, through bodhicitta we can begin to transform evil. We can transform the challenges of life into fuel or f- reason for awakening, for bodhi. So transforming all mishaps on into the path of bodhi means you transform, especially when the world just seems so destitute, like it does now. You know, we're stuck here, quarantine. We had smoke on top of COVID quarantine, then we've got the political situation, the environmental situation. It just seems to get worse and worse. So what do we do with that, you know? How do, we, how do we come out of this stronger? This is really a training on how to grow up, how to mature. And so from the Lojong perspective, the way that we transform all mishaps, all sorrows, all suffering into the path of awakening, whatever that might mean to you, you know, it might mean... Uh, uh, the age of reason, like waking up intellectually, understanding the world better, having a better sense of ethics and ethos, understanding the world in a way that gives you a sense of um, belonging and purpose. Or it could be all the way to enlightenment, like the Buddha taught. But we do this through our shamatha practice, our developing the capacity to stay, stay present, with what's happening in the moment, not running away. We do that through vipassana, through the insight that comes when we rest and we watch the mind. We see it play its games again and again and again. We develop patience with it, capacity, generosity, all the six perfections, concentration, wisdom discipline, diligence, all of that is folded within the meditation practice, of course. So we do this by shamatha, calm abiding, vipassana, insight, and bodhicitta, which is what we cultivate through the tonglen practice, the sending and receiving and building our capacity to feel compassion even for our so-called enemies. And this is what we've been working on week after week. I'm curious to know how that's going for you. Maybe when we have discussion time, you could share. So what they're saying in this amazing slogan that really is the the crux of the Lojong mind training teachings is that all hardships can be integrated into the path of awakening, that there's always going to be difficulties in our life. This isn't new. It's true for everyone at various times in our life. And so we we can also train out of the blame game. This is like no more blame, you know. When you're blaming the world, blaming your parents, blaming your ex, blaming your kids, whatever. Even blaming yourself. You're disempowering yourself. You're placing the power out there somewhere. And you're perhaps unknowingly victimizing yourself, yeah. Oh, it's their fault then the power is out there. You've lost your power. So this is another way of like growing up. Like let's stop blaming the world for our suffering and let's figure it out. 
and transform mishaps onto the path. You know, for example, the Buddhist teachings talk about impermanence. You could be rich one day and poor the next. Your partner could, you know, is your beloved one day and then they do something horrible to you and they become your enemy and so on. I mean, things are always changing. And there's a quote that that touched me. It was actually something I heard in a podcast interview with, of all people, Amy Schumer, the comedian. (laughs) She was talking about when she became famous and how that was for her and the challenges and the gifts that came from that and that a beautiful teaching came to her from the director Judd Apatow and he said Amy when you become rich you realize that the best things in life are free when you become rich you realize the best things in life are free and that is another way of saying this that in fact you know what seems like a blessing may be a curse What seems like a curse may be a blessing. We don't know if that mishap is actually one of the greatest things that's ever happened to us. We don't know. So we train and we watch and we listen. Even those who are successful don't feel adequate. So impermanence, if you're unsuccessful, you feel, oh, I'm inadequate. If someday I become famous and rich, I'll be great and happy. But often it's the people who are rich and famous who are the most unhappy. So we have to look at our own poverty mentality and get out of the blame game. And for me, this is a great teaching here. Transform all mishaps or all suffering, all mishaps into the path of awakening. So through the practice of shamatha, vipassana, tonglen, you become rich with integrity. You become rich with courage. You become rich with joy and a a very grounded sense of satisfaction with your life. So your inner strength grows, and no matter what happens, you have that profound resourcefulness and richness within you. And then you can give, tong, where you're sending, and then receiving, taking in with the breath. And we cultivate and we realize this inherent sense of wealth within us through our generosity. So it's through generosity that we become rich. So true wealth is said in the Buddhist teachings to be free of wanting, desire, greed, attachment. That is true wealth. So it's through these practices that we cultivate this maturity and we're able to transform mishaps into the path of awakening. We use it for fuel. So right now, we use our situation for fuel of awakening. That's what I've got for that slogan. Well, <laughs> I, I want to highlight what, yeah. uh, what Walt shared here. That uh, if you want to get along, you go along. And and what that really you know makes me think is um, when we start to really apply these practices, we are truly uh, going against the stream of not only our contemporary culture, but I think maybe a lot of. Uh, our friends and loved ones who are maybe not in the practice. So when really challenging things happen or, or people really want to go like catastrophe level about the world and you're like, yeah, opportunities to practice. Nobody wants to hear it. They might not even want to engage with you as a friend anymore. Right. And this idea that Walt is highlighting that the way that we get along is kind of going along with what's happening. And then in fact, this this act of radical compassion, of caring about what is happening that is difficult, as much as we would care about what was happening that was good, might not be easy for a lot of folks. It might actually not help us get along with others for a time. And so just wanting to kind of highlight that, that it's really not, um, not the kinds of priorities that we see highlighted and reflected to us in our contemporary culture like oh let's not blame people 
that doesn't really come naturally. And yet, you know, I think we don't need to wish for that or aspire to that out of some sort of moral high ground. We just look at our own suffering. How hard is it to hold on to an idea that someone or something is evil? It's terrible. It's like something caught in the back of your throat. You know, it's like, oh, you just can't, um, you can't find peace. And I think for many of us here, the ultimate goal is peace of mind. That is what we want by any means necessary. And, and some of that requires that we do kind of go against the grain or go against the flow of what might in the short term seem comforting might even help us get along with others. There's nothing like gossiping and fetching that really makes people feel connected. And yet, right, just like eating an unhealthy meal, maybe about 45 minutes later, we're back in our rumination spin out. We've really fired ourselves up about what's wrong. So we wanna apply, just as Chandra so beautifully said, apply all these practices to our life experience, attending closely and noticing, what is it like when I, get on this catastrophizing um, bent with my friends about how terrible everything is and how much worse it's getting. How long does that help us? Um, though we don't wanna too early apply our antidote, right? Cause there's nothing more annoying than someone who is, is reminding you in the moment, oh, you should turn that adversity into an opportunity. Uh, and that's why I think many of you have heard this phrase before, the AFOG which I don't know who came up with it. I really wish I know. I would love to credit them, but the acronym is a fucking opportunity of growth. Um, so we so often hear, oh, it's such an opportunity for growth. And it kind of gives us a little sense that, yeah, thanks, great. I'm 2020, we got it. <laughs> Let's have something else. So. And we'd, we'd love to hear from you all. Any thoughts, reflections? This is provoking and challenging what we're asking here, what we're reflecting on here. I see Gina and Sylvia. Oh yeah. I see, yep. I, I felt that coming. Yes, please. Please unmute yourself. You just go to the bottom left. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> Hi everybody. Hi Eve. Hi Chandra. Um, it's funny because I didn't want to talk. I just was telling Sylvia how <laughs> to do something, but since you, <laughs> since you asked, um, I was whisked out of the street three weeks ago and diagnosed with blood cancer. Being a perfectly healthy person, I thought, and I've been out and in of the hospital already twice and started treatment. Mm -hmm. um, it has just upended our lives. I can't tell you how strongly, but I would like to say something um, incredible that happened to me um, while I was lying in bed in the hospital. Um, I kept hearing um, words from you, Chandra, and from somebody else that I so sometimes hear is his name is Howard Cohen. And the words that came to me were amazing. One of those words were everything welcome, everything welcome. So I was lying there taking the chemo and I was just like, everything welcome. I didn't feel I was getting any poison or anything like that. I was just feeling, this is what I'm getting. I, I was incredibly fortunate to be saved. I could have died on the street. I didn't know I was so ill. And uh, somebody just called and said, you need to go to the emergency right now. He said, why? I just came back from Trader's Joe <laughs> that morning and there I was. And so, I want to tell uh, Chandra that while I was there in the hospital, I kept going back to YouTube to hear about the three poisons. There was a, 
there was a, a beautiful, incredibly beautiful meditation that you led um, that just got me through so much. And I wanted to thank you, truly thank you. I kept sending it to Sylvia every morning. Listen to this when you're very disturbed. It's going to help you. I swear it's helping me. And it did. Thank you. Thank you, both Eve and Chandra and everybody around. Thanks. Oh, thank you. I feel my goosebumps. So thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm glad to see you back home on the couch. <laughs> and I hope, you know, I hope that this welcoming in helped that chemo be as powerful and positive and healing as it possibly can. And I'm really so glad that any little thing that I've done out there somewhere has helped you in that way. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the beautiful exemplifying the teachings. I mean, it's all wonderful to talk about, but to really in that moment, um, find that. And I'm sure your experience, um, whatever the experiences of Gina is different than the experience of Sylvia, right? Even, and we are interdependent and these are both impacting and challenging. And um, I'm just, yeah, deeply moved. You are absolutely in my heart now and prayers, of course. And also, yeah, just very, um, I feel so, um, I don't know what the right word, just so grateful to know that you have the teachings with you and they may, may or may not always be helpful, but they were helpful in the moment and that you shared that with us. Truly, we can't have a better teaching. <laughs> we really just can't. Yeah, yeah. As much as is comfortable for you, um, please let us know how we can be of support. Yeah, yeah, anyway. Yeah, thank you. I see two, three questions here. Uh, ben shares, viewing other people as simply evil is primitive coping strategy when things are too bad to make sense. To not do that, we should probably have some other coping strategy in place for the things that are too bad or confusing for our current capacity. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, <laughs> finding what that is for us, as Chandra was suggesting, that there might be a different um, antidote um, that really is working. In some way, you know, in our own capacity, and I'm not preaching at all, I'm really not, but there's some way that we can begin to see everyone as our teacher, right? Like whether they're wise or unskillful, learning from it and using it. That's another way. So it's true that instead of just labeling someone as just plain evil, starting to see how, okay, maybe I need to stop them from doing what they're doing because it's so bad. But then what can I learn from that? How can I learn from that? So everything is nuanced, has a multidimensional. We, it's easy to make evil people into cartoons in our mind. So having that different approach, might that might help that. The next person is, I'm wondering if understanding evil or harmful behavior is necessary or will that thought process just lead to spiraling? Sometimes evil, harm, or mishap seems outside of misunderstanding and trying to understand may just prolong or increase suffering. Can you address this? Well, the first sentence here, I'm wondering if understanding evil or harmful behavior is necessary or will that thought process just lead to spiraling. So I think evil and harmful behavior is just, for some reason, it's, it exists, right? Whether you believe in God or not, or karma, for some reason, it's here. It's here, and it's here to stay. And so um, finding ways to cope with it and to learn from it is very important. Eve, do you want to address the next part of the question? Yeah, yeah. I think that there's a really, um, you know, a delicate balance. Sometimes our understanding can loosen 
the kind of conf confines of our feeling of being right. Um, in that we start to pull apart a little bit here and a little bit there. I'm certain this is wrong. This person's all wrong, 100% wrong, never been right. And so understanding can help. We can also just simply apply, you know, in these uh, wonderful um, teachings of Shanti Deva, he gives us a couple ways to work with our anger towards others. And one is just recognizing complexity. You don't even need to know like, oh, they had a bad childhood, they were excluded, they came from this terrible place. Just recognize complexity. So we may not need to, I think uh, what you're pointing out, Donna, is like sometimes we get so caught up in the like, well, what did happen to them? And why were they? Maybe it was this, or maybe they didn't have a good relationship with their mom, or maybe it was their dad, right? And we can <laughs> get a little too involved. It could suffice for us to know it's complex. And however well we think we know the person, maybe they're our sibling. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know their lived complexity, what leads to their behaviors and their actions that are experienced by us as uh, pure or at least uh, often evil, wrong, or bad. Um, so I think that's a wonderful distinction. I hope that um, I hope that that helps, Donna. Um, and we also have another great challenging question here. <laughs> um, how do we avoid the interpretation that if our own suffering can lead to Bodhi, others' suffering can therefore lead them to self-improvement and self-realization, consequently making us more dismissive of their condition? I guess it's like, if it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger. Um, and also uh, with a follow-up, Noam saying, I have a similar question, how do I make peace with the people causing suffering to others? Hmm. I, yeah. Go please. ahead, do you, you <laughs> either one, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, okay, I, I will say that I, I think with the, um, you know, I think this, this false equanimity, um, this near enemy of aloofness, like, oh, they're suffering? Oh, they're probably learning so much. What an amazing opportunity they have. Um, that is absolutely a hazard. Well, I think that's well pointed out. And for us, it's, um, I think, always training our heart, always training this alchemical process of being able to take in the suffering with care. And when it is possible, when it is ours, when it is within kind of what is... Um, not, um, I don't even know what the right way to say this, when it is possible or available for us to act, to prevent the harm, we do so. But we're not of the mindset, whenever there's harm, I need to intervene. And we're also not of the mindset of whenever there's harm, well, that's okay, they're learning, they're growing. It's whenever there's harm, we, we draw that in with our compassionate heart. And from there, we assess whether there is something to actually do or enact um, that is something that you know and so you know and and a little dovetails with with gnomes follow-up of when another person is harming others it's not as though we hold them in compassion and then we just stay there okay i'm holding them in compassion for their whatever complexity led to their harmful behavior in the world it's more that's where we start and then from that place we aren't acting out of a reactivity. We're not just, you know, they're bad, they're wrong, they hurt. We're holding in compassion their suffering and complexity so that we then, with our kind of wisdom, can understand and discern what's mine to do. What can I do? Can I, if it's a politician, write a letter, write a congressman, write my school board. Um, if it's a friend or loved one, can I confront them? Can I let them know they're doing harm to themselves or others? We like our first stop almost along the way is being able to hold them and their experience with compassion. Hope that's helpful. That's great. No, oh, great answer, Eve. It's true. There's no instruction to be complacent here or to say, "Oh, that's their karma to suffer." Uh, Amaji, I was just reading some of her teachings. Amaji, the great saint, uh, uh, Amrita Ananda Mayi, right? She's the hugging saint. She gives darshan through hugs. How many people have been hugged by Ama? <laughs> yeah. 
But she said, you know, they say in the Hindu tradition and in the Buddhist tradition that that we, you know, all all of our experiences arise due to causes and conditions, right? And that karma, the cause and effect gives rise to our suffering, our joy, and everything in between. But she said, okay, that's fine. I can accept that. But I, it doesn't stop there. If it's somebody's karma to suffer, then it is my dharma to help them be free of that suffering. And dharma in this context means my duty, which is really the ancient understanding of dharma, is your purpose. So we don't stop there, and this is not meant to be a way of uh, encouraging dismissiveness or idleness around when we see suffering happening within ourselves as well as within others. Okay, so... Yeah, so it's time now to have our second practice. So let's go ahead and dive in now. That's a lot of rich uh, topics and kind of challenging ways of approaching our lives were introduced and discussed. Now let's drop in again and do a little more practice, go a little deeper with the integration. And so I will guide you through a Tonglen practice. And this practice is uh, very much based in a common way that the Tonglen is done in Tibet. And it's uh, kind of been a bit adapted by Lama Tsultra Malioni. So this form of Tonglen I'm guiding you in tonight is uh, is from Lama Tsultra. And it will take us right up to the hour. So we'll have about the last 15 minutes in meditation. So finding a comfortable seat and drop in to your breath and your belly, coming home to the breath in the body in the moment and releasing tension with the out breath. So I'm going to guide you through this and this is in a sense using the mind in meditation but not in the way that the question earlier arose going from thought to thought but actually creative visualization as a way to cultivate compassion within us. So we'll first begin by taking nine relaxation breaths with long exhalations. For the first few breaths here, breathe into any physical tension in your body and releasing the tension with the exhalation. And for the second few breaths now, inhale into any emotional tension. Feel where you hold it in your body and release it with the exhalation. And lastly, breathe into any mental tension. Feel where you hold nervousness, worries, or mental blockages in your body and release them with the exhalation. And we begin the Donglen with this flash of absolute bodhicitta, this flash of emptiness, this absolute reality. It's true nature of your own heart, mind. And within the arena of that absolute nature of interdependence, the lack of substantial materiality within this space of absolute mind. From that space, now imagine that before you is your own mother. 
imagining her in front of you. <clears throat> and if you never knew your mother, bring to mind someone who is like a mother to you. And seeing her or them in front of you, perhaps the last time you saw her, cultivating compassion very much includes feeling a sense of compassion for your own parents and in this case our own mother who gave us life who cared for us and it's this compassion that we can then spread to others in our life friends foes so even if you didn't have or haven't had a good relationship, whether it was good or bad, with your mother, we still begin with her. So seeing her in front of you, or this mother figure, and remember their compassion. Think first of the gift of the body they gave you. And if working with your birth mother recognized that she carried you in her womb for nine months, which in itself is a sacrifice, not something comfortable to do, and then she gave birth to you, which is also something she had to undergo, think about how she cared for you with this self-sacrifice. Your mother, this mother figure, cared for your needs, your complaints as a child, your illnesses, perhaps your lack of gratitude, your expectations, your greed and need, everything a child naturally has. And she had her own grief anxiety or pain and yet she did her best perhaps while caring for you she was also experiencing sickness and aging and the knowledge that she would die try to imagine your own mother's suffering the different kinds of suffering she underwent and perhaps is still undergoing. And imagine this suffering in a personal way. Even if she was handicapped by a problem like alcoholism, think how that made her not take good care. She got caught in that because of her suffering. and really feel her in a personal way and now feel a longing to relieve that suffering and with your breath breathing in as though through your nose your breath is like a vacuum it can be pulling with the in-breath her suffering breathe it in and remove it and as you reach the end of the inhalation, flash on emptiness. And then exhale, freedom from suffering, freedom from fear and the clearing of her karmas. So breathing in and breathing out in this way, really being willing to take her burden. And flash on emptiness as it comes into you with the exhalation, see it leave as it clear, as a clear, cool breeze that clears her karmic stream. And gradually see her clearing and becoming more peaceful. The exhalation carries a white light that permeates her body and the in-breath keeps pulling out any of her negative karmic patterns, her fear or her pain. 
her suffering is being peeled off of her and dissolving into your luminous empty heart. And then from that space, you're sending out love and compassion. And see her begin to be full of serenity, freedom from fear, freedom from attachment, hatred, aggression. And she, that she has everything she needs, food, clothing, helpers, peace, freedom. And see her physically change. Her appearance changes as she clears and imagine her attaining full awakening even. And see those qualities arise in her and offer her that awakening with the exhalation. Now in the next phase of practice, imagine that next to her is a friend, an easy person, someone whom it is easy to feel love and compassion for, perhaps a young child, an old person, or a dear friend, and see this person next to your mother facing you. And then imagine yourself relieving their suffering through breathing it in, flashing on emptiness in the luminous heart of bodhicitta and releasing with the exhalation. Breathing in any physical or psychological or spiritual pain that person might have and releasing it with the exhalation and giving back to them the cool breeze of clarity and awakening. And see this being changed as you do this. See them physically change. Being willing to, even within this imaginary space, to just for now taking in their suffering with the in-breath, dissolving it into emptiness and then release the awakened energy of compassion that clears their karmic stream with the out-breath. See them cleared and awakened like a Buddha. See their Buddha nature shining through. And then now imagine that on the other side of your mother is a difficult person, an enemy or someone who wants to cause harm to you. It could be someone you find challenging. And see them very clearly. And then breathe in their suffering, recognize it and flash on emptiness as you breathe into the heart space and then release to them love and compassion, recognizing that like you, they wish to be free of suffering. Their suffering and negativity may feel like hot and sticky. And if you're willing to take it, to pull it off, dissolve it into luminous absolute bodhicitta at your heart and release the relative force of love and compassion with the out-breath. Gradually see them transform as the layers of confusion and delusion are removed. And see this difficult person emerging as a luminous Buddha, 
being who is on the way to waking up to the absolute truth as all the obscurations and negativity have been removed. really seeing them physically change, be free from their suffering, and now allow this practice of Tonglen to expand to include all of those in our Zoom room, everybody here in this space together, and feel a willingness to take to remove and to carry our suffering. But hold that with an understanding of emptiness and then release the cool breeze of compassion with the out-breath. And then gradually expand out to include all the beings on the land around you, in your home or your apartment or apartment building, the seen and unseen beings all around you. So your practice is becoming more vast, becoming more inconceivable. So the in-breath is still this pulling in of the negativity, flashing on emptiness, and releasing of compassion that clears and awakens. Expanding to this inconceivable number of beings, animals, humans, even in this corner of the world, and feel your own vastness, your own immeasurability, understanding the absolute reality of doing this practice in the relative world within the framework of the immeasurable nature of mind. And offer out to all beings now, everywhere, the insight and understanding and awakening to their true nature, freedom from suffering. See them wake up and their karmic obscurations clear. The breath pulling off the veil of suffering, confusion, delusion, flashing on emptiness, and then with the out-breath feel their awakened nature lighting up. And now, as you open your eyes, keeping that experience of the relative compassion, bodhicitta, relative level, as well as the absolute bodhicitta, the interconnectedness, the empty nature of all of us. You could even look at the gallery view and just look at each other for a moment, taking in the community of practitioners. And then now let's go ahead and dedicate the merit as a way to close our time together. This offering up of any positive energy that's come from our time for the benefit of all beings, self and others. It's called the twofold benefit of self and other. And we offer it in that offering, it becomes vast and immeasurable. Mm, may 
be so. So thank you, everyone. I hope you found that um, helpful in some way, maybe different, definitely different than how I usually teach it. And um, Eve, thank you for the beautiful teachings tonight, and Pamela and Mays for hosting, and Katie as well, and Noam. Gratitude to everybody here. Lots of love. Yeah, if we want, we can unmute maybe, huh? Mm. Unmute and hear each other's voices. Thank you, Chandra. That was so yeah. beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the love wave. <laughs> Thank you, Eve. Mm. Good night, everybody. See you next week. Maybe we'll see who's teaching next week. Eve, we need to <laughs> either one or both. <laughs> Thank Lots you so of love. Much. Take Thank care, you so everybody. Much. Thank yeah. you. That was exactly the medicine that was needed. For mm -hmm. sure. Thank you. Good. Thank you.